So at one church, there was a little boy named Alvin standing out in the narthex there in the, in the entryway, and he was looking up at this plaque and just studying it, there, studying it for a while. And the pastor, as he was sort of um, releasing people, noticed the boy standing there, and then finally the pastor went up to him and said, um, so Alvin, um, uh, you really like that plaque? You're very interested? And he kind of nodded his head and said, yeah, yeah. So then he said, um, well, the, Alvin said, but pastor, what do those flags mean next to everybody's name? And he said, and the pastor said, well, those are the people who died in service. And so the boy thought about it for a few minutes and said, was it the eight o'clock service or the 1030 service? <laughs> Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen. What you are doing right here, right now, is military service. It is warfare. Intense, all-out combat. It's a struggle to come here on Sunday mornings. It's a struggle after working all week or maybe partying last night to actually get up, get dressed, or get the kids up and get them dressed. I imagine that some of you probably argued on the way here, right? Right? happens all the time. See, understand that this is warfare, and the devil throws everything he has in his arsenal at you to keep you from worshiping. He throws at you our culture of relativism and immorality and, and also our consumerism and, yeah, just our, our just extravagant living. But he also throws at us our spouses, our children, our neighbors, and an unchurched culture. In fact, because of what Satan does, there are casualties. Literally, some of our brothers and sisters die and cannot make it here. Some are disgruntled or disenchanted. Some are led away or simply fall away, including even pastors. When 60% of us are not here on a Sunday, the devil wins. And when the devil wins, people go to hell. Now for those of us who are winning, you are winning because God has upheld his word in your life. He's upheld his word. Let me show you what I mean. Let us take a look at Exodus chapter 17 in our reading today and take a look at verse 11. And it says this, as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. And when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. To say God's word has been upheld, it means that God has put a stone under it, a firm foundation to uphold it so that it does not fall. God has upheld his word. And when God's word is upheld in our life, we win. And when we win, people are saved. So to talk about the meaning of upheld, I want to break open Webster with you a little bit and just look at some of the words that that means. So to say that God's word was upheld in this battle means that during the battle, God's word is supported, sustained, maintained, defended, endorsed, advocated, and encouraged. It is set upon a stone. Without God's word upheld in our lives, we waver, salvation wavers, but God has put a stone under it so that it will not fall, so that it is held up prominently in our lives so that we win. Now, something that's kind of interesting about God's word is, is that, uh, well, as we think of this word here, I'm thinking of a time like Moses when his arms were weak, when I felt that way. This was May 30th, 2010. That perhaps for me in ministry was the most challenging day of worship in my entire life. 
not just because it was my first day of leading the congregation as a liturgist, but because three, four days before that, on May 26, 2010, my mother was arrested for alleged fraud charges. So as I went to stand up in front of that congregation then, I was feeling pretty tired. Tired and fatigued from all of the stress and the tension from that week, but actually self-conscious and concerned about what people were thinking as I was standing up there. Were they seeing a son of God or the son of a felon? So this makes me think about who it is that we're talking about in our passage in Exodus chapter 17. Understand that Moses was a murderer. Matthew, who wrote our gospel lesson today, was a corrupt tax collector. Paul went to stone people out of his zeal for his own faith. And all throughout the Bible, prophets and apostles were all thrown in jail. And yet, because these are the people who write our word, sometimes we may feel a little ashamed of it, ashamed to uphold it or support it in our lives. There was a particular uh, professor at a university, a philosophy professor, who had lectured on how foolish people are to believe in the Bible. And so then he asked his class, he said, raise your hand if you believe in God. Well, one person, one person, and was actually a member from our church, actually was brave enough to raise her hand. And when she did so, a classmate behind her said, you're stupid. We may be afraid to raise our hands and uphold our Bible because we're afraid people may think we are stupid. Stupid to believe in a Bible that's written by people, people who had the past like Moses had. And yet, what we're reading today is that Moses was willing to raise both hands, amen? And when God's word is upheld, upheld high, we win. And when we win, people are saved. And still, Moses' hands became, grew tired and they began to sink down. And as they sank down, the people started to lose. You know, sometimes the word of God is like that for us. We kind of get tired. Maybe it's kind of boring for us. It loses its impotence or its importance or its relevance in our lives. And we don't really care to read it. See, the definition of a post-Christian society, which we are in, is one where people no longer turn to the word of God for their moral direction. So a few years ago, when I was trying to caution a brother about sex outside of marriage, he looked at me as if I was naive and totally ignored me. Sometimes we completely don't even want to listen to God's word, or sometimes we think we have heard it all. See, what is it, about 27% um, of the people um, actually go to worship regularly, and even far fewer numbers of that actually read the Bible every day? People have said to me, I've read the Bible cover to cover. I know what's in there. So yeah, um, we totally forget the third commandment, which is about remembering the Sabbath day, meaning not to despise the word of God and its preaching, but to gladly hear it and learn it. A lot of times we think we already know it all and we don't need the word of God. The word of God sort of gets tired, gets boring and we start to lose interest and it begins to sink in our lives. But what we have here today is this witness from God that that word of God is upheld even as we get tired. God prominently puts it up there and puts it on a stone so that we win. We win. Now the devil wins though. The devil wins when we uphold his word. See, here's what I mean. In Revelation, it talks about the third person of an unholy trinity that is coming. This third person is the Antichrist. The Antichrist has a false prophet. And this third person false prophet spews out into the world lies and all kinds of confusion about God's word. 
John, the apostle who wrote Revelation, actually writes another letter. He says, be careful not to believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are truly from God. He says, here's how you can recognize the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is anything that denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Basically, anything that denies that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, physically died. Anything that denies that Jesus Christ lives within us is all from the spirit of the Antichrist. It's the false prophet. Recently, there was a, there was a gentleman uh, who I had baptized actually a few years ago who texted me excitedly saying how he had found this sort of Christian revival uh, where they had this oil, right, this special oil that seems to be flowing miraculously out of this Bible. And he was kind of touting how important and amazing this oil was. I was telling the chapel, um, kids in chapel about this the other day. Well, understand that there's some deception that happens in this world a false prophet, and that false prophet can actually perform miracles in the name of Jesus to deceive the people. Satan's word is upheld when we support or uphold the words of the false prophet. But God is upholding his own word. He's upholding it by putting this rock under his prophet, Moses, so that we know and so that we can see his victory and we win. We win. So now I want to direct you all, direct your attention to some artwork. Um, it's, a, it's actually a painting called Lord O Victory. I'm not sure if it's on the screen or not, but you will definitely find it in your bulletin. Um, it, is a, it is a painting from 1871. If I can invite you all to, to take a look at that painting with me. And I want you to study what you see in this painting. In it, you should see to the, uh, to the left side of the image there, you will see Aaron tightly clutching the staffed hand of Moses. And then on the right side of the image, you will see Hur, who is uh, of the tribe of Judah, holding the prophet's hand closely to his heart. And then there in the middle, you'll see sort of a, a crestfallen, uh, downcast uh, a Moses sort of sitting there on a rock, sort of weary, but with his arms he um, held up high. Now, when the Christian sees that, we see a prophet, priest, and king. In Moses, we see a prophet, the Word of God personified. But then, in Aaron, we see a priest. And then, in her, of the tribe of David, we see a king. Now, whenever we Christians see prophet, priest, and king all at one time, we are seeing the Messiah. We're seeing Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ, for us, is prophet, priest, and king. He is the one who saves us. Maybe you all will be able to see it better than if you look at the text with me once again in Exodus chapter 17. It says there in Exodus chapter 17, when we look at, uh, when we look at the verse 11 there, it talks about how he held up his hands, both his hands. So I was wondering if you can see it now. Jesus' hands were nailed up high for six excruciating hours. They were held up high so that the Word of God would be upheld. His hands were nailed up high so that we could win. They were held up high so that all who believe in Jesus Christ will not perish, but have everlasting life. And yes, they were held up high for me, so on May 30th, I would have understood as I was up in front of everyone that it is precisely when God's people are chained, ashamed, and arrested that God upholds his word through Jesus Christ. 
And then, when it seemed like Satan had won, when Jesus was placed into a tomb, what happens on the third day? The stone is rolled aside and an angel comes and sits on the stone and proclaims that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. God puts a stone under his word to uphold it. He does it so that we will believe. He does it so that we know that his word is upheld so that in our battles to be here in worship, we win. And when we win, when we win, people are saved. So now, I'd like for you all to see yourself in that image, in that portrait, in that battle. See, Peter helps us to understand this. Uh, you, everyone, are the rock. You're the rock. You, everyone, are actually the priest and even the king. In Peter's um, second letter, he has um, this to say about all of us, the, the body of Christ. He says this. This is from uh, Peter in his letter, uh, his first letter, chapter 2, verse 5. He says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual household to be a holy priesthood. And then in verse 9, he says, you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. You're royal like her, and you are priesthood like Aaron. But then, like Moses, you personify that word of God. And it is on our confession, on our testimony of Jesus, that God has set his word into the world so that it would be upheld. God has upheld his word. He upholds it through Jesus Christ who lives in you, prophet, priest, and king, a royal priesthood, living stones. That is what I saw on May 30th, 2010. I saw all of you. I saw the stones on which the word of God is indeed upheld. Here are four ways, four ways that I can certainly see that we uphold word, the word of God. Four ways. Number one, everybody say learning. By learning the word of God, we fulfill the third of commandment. By learning the word of God, we are acknowledging that he is our savior to the whole world. Number two, everybody say giving. By actually giving our offering, our financial support to God's word of ministry, we're acknowledging him as king. To tithe is to give to the king his portion, his 10% of what we gain in our victory from this battle. Number three, everybody say caring. caring. When we care for one another, we are holding up one another's hands, just like we saw the kids demonstrating today. We're helping one another carry that word of God. We're helping one another in our times of pain and illness and suffering. In our time of weakness, we're holding ourselves up in our faith. And lastly, number four, everybody say speaking. Proclaim it, everybody. Speak it out loud. Don't keep it a secret. Shout it from the rooftops. Jesus Christ is our Savior. We're winning through him. Judy Watson actually gave me permission to tell you about a time when she was on a tour, and the tour guide was talking about everything from the standpoint of evolution, and she actually raised her hand and spoke up and said, I don't believe in evolution. I believe in a God who created everything. Speak up. This is the word of God. Uphold it in your life. Support it. Learn it. Give for it. Care for one another in it and speak it. Back in 2010, on that day, as I stood in front of the congregation, what I came to discover on that day was that the congregation was actually not there to throw stones at me, but to actually be a stone for me. On that particular day, and it was a Memorial Day weekend, the church was fuller than I'd ever seen it before on that time of year, that time of year. And I saw lots of faces out there that I hadn't seen in a long time. But as they stood out there, I was encouraged. I was encouraged by all of them in my faith. And in the days after that, 
um, people continued to actually uphold me. They upheld me by attending Bible studies that I actually led. They also gave, many of them gave generously uh, toward bond money to get my mom out for a week during Easter. And then uh, they certainly also cared for me and my family. People brought us meals. They helped us out in a lot of different ways. And then, of course, they spoke up. You know, it was interesting. As I was out in the parking lot or different places, people from the church came up to me and they said, Tony, you always pray for us. Let me pray for you. In all these ways, people just like you right here now were a stone for me a minister of God's word, you held my hands up so that I could communicate the word to you and hold you up. We carry this together. We support one another. We uphold one another as stones for Christ. Yes, everybody, it is really hard to do this. We get tired, just like Moses. We sometimes are even ashamed to hold our hands up. Uh, sometimes it's hard to hear God's word. I've heard that before, or maybe I don't want to hear that. But understand today that God has put in our lives a stone, a stone in Jesus, prophet, priest, and king, but a stone of Jesus in each one of you as you learn God's word, as you give, as you care for one another, and as you speak that word. Christ is the stone in our battle. And by that stone, we win. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.